Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix channel. This is Moshix and today we're going to be looking at Rex, um, the, the uh, default mainframe scripting language Rex um, and if you remember uh, I've been asking for the last couple of weeks if there was anybody could give me access to ZOS, um, a TSO login on a, TS, on a ZOS system and one of the main reasons for that is that, of course, I wanted to look at the compilers because um, that's of primary interest to me. But um, we have all those compilers on MBS 3.8 as well. What we don't have on MBS uh, 3.8 is Rex in TSO. Um, uh, Rex was only introduced, I believe, with MBS XA, if I'm not mistaken, around 1984 or so. Um, uh, it was, to be more precise, it was introduced with TSO Extended uh, 2, uh, which I think came out in 1984 together with MBS uh, uh, XA. And as such, uh, we don't have a Rex in our beloved uh, MBS 3.8 um, and, and in none of the distributions, distributions such as TK4 or the um, Turnkey 3. Uh, all of those, of those have no REC support. Now, there is REC support in Hercules at the Hercules level, um, uh, meaning that uh, you can run, there is an, interpreted, an interpreter for REC built into Hercules itself so that you can use REC to script uh, Hercules, but that has nothing to do with the operating systems uh, running on top of uh, Hercules. Um, and so there's really no way to use uh, to use uh, Rex um, on MBS, and so, um, but you know, Rex is a very important component of uh, of the mainframe world. Um, anytime people need to do something quick and dirty, um, Rex is the go-to language uh, still today on the mainframe. And there's a huge following of uh, Rex enthusiasts uh, uh, all over the world. And finally, Rex has been ported to almost any operating system out there. It is the standard scripting language for the Amiga OS, by the way. It's called A-Rex on the Amiga. Um, it was the default, obviously, on OS2. It's on AIX, obviously. Those are all IBM uh, operating systems. But it's also on Linux. It's on it's on, Word, on, on Windows and any other uh, platform you can think of has uh, Rex interpreters. IBM obviously went one step further and also has um, has uh, Rex compilers. And I'm not sure if this ZOS uh, has um, Rex compiler. We can see here in foreground. Um, yes, so there appears to be a compiler for Rex 370. Um, and we're going to be looking at that in a little bit. So we're going to be looking at how to compile Rex uh, later. But at the beginning, let's just see how to work with MVS in uh, with the interpreted Rex. Um, and so I've written a couple of uh, um, uh, scripts that we can execute. Uh, for those who don't know the language, just a very brief introduction. Um, uh, so the one thing that's a little different in Rex is that uh, variables have no type, meaning they're not numbers or strings or 64-bit or 32-bit uh, 32 or anything like that. They have no type. Uh, you can at one time put a string into a, ver a Rex variable. The next time you can put a number um, and the numbers are always, um, uh, I believe in this case, 32-bit. Um, now. Uh, and at the beginning, every variable um, will uh, evaluate to its own name in uppercase. So if I say, say hello, and I've never put any value in the variable hello, it will come out as hello. And then if I put in 25 and say hello, now I will say 25. Um, then the other thing too that's a little different in Rex is that there are really no arrays. Um, you have something called stems. Um, and so friends, if I do have a loop here from uh, the counts from one to 10, I can say that stem i, and so it will be like the array index if we had array variables, um, and then 10 minus 9. And, um, you can also uh, drop a variable so that it will not occupy memory anymore, which, um, which is uh, really interesting for, a, for an interpreted language. Um, but uh, this is just a very, very basic introduction into 
uh, uh, rex variables and then uh, constructs you have do while loops uh, loop obviously do while and then let's say i uh, below 10 and so uh, you have this way or you can do do until uh, so you can control if if the instructions are always going to be executed or not um, you can do uh, a for loop what you call a for loop in uh, in c or in, in basic um, um, by doing do while start to increment and for um, by the way uh, the uh, the original author of rex uh, michael Cal mike kalushaw here's his name uh, wrote this language in 79 um, on his own as a side project while on his free time at ibm um, and it was introduced to the uh, ibm share community in a conference in Houston in 1981 and people were enthusiastic about it and so IBM started offering as a as a product but what I wanted to say is that he wanted it to be easier than PL1 he's uh, my college is a PL1 programmer or was a PL1 programmer foremost back then um, and which happens also to be my favorite language on the mainframe and uh, and so he wanted to be uh, somewhat compatible with PL1 but easier um, so this is the um, loops then um, you can also say do forever um, then you need to have a way to get out of the loop obviously and then there's the if conditions um, if a condition then do this and else do end um, very simple so this is just for you to have a very very quick introduction to Rex so you can read what I'm going to do here so and once we've done that let's run some Rex um, so the easiest way to run it is if you write it in the editor, in the ISPF editor. And by the way, this is the um, ZOS system uh, that I was granted by, the, by Preston here in the US. I don't know exactly where this system is, but it's somewhere here in the US. Um, and uh, thank you, Preston. Um, and um, so uh, let's go to dataset list. And I have here some code. And let's start by, I have this code here. Now every, every uh, PL1 pro, uh, sorry, every Rex program needs to start with a comment on the very first line that says Rex. <laughs> um, that's how MBS, uh, that's how ZOS knows it. It needs to invoke the interpreter for Rex. And so you always need to have this, the word Rex somehow here in the in the first line um, like I'm doing here and this is a prime number generator uh, the last couple of videos we'll be using prime number generators to test stuff um, and so um, let's um, let's run this Rex program to find the first uh, the all the um, prime numbers up to a hundred and so what we do here is um, we uh, we run through all the numbers and then use standard uh, um, uh, standard mathematical means to find out if it's if it's um, if it's a prime number or not and uh, and then when we find the prime number we print it out here um, very simple uh, I think this is what 20 lines of code um, so um, let's finish this and the way to execute it would be to just say execute here um, so remember where we are here we're in 3.4 in the data set list my source is a member in here and I execute it by doing this and then um, it runs and it's done and then it tells me return code zero now we can also run this in a different way uh, execute no shakes uh, work of, uh, what was the name of the prime rex I think ah, um, I don't remember the, <laughs> the prime rex yeah it was okay so uh, execute or shakes work from prime rex. Oops. 
about the noise in the background I have people uh, fixing my air condition um, you don't want to have your air condition breaking in Texas um, you need it uh, anyway so this work um, Moshik's work Prog Prime Rex um, by executing that uh, we can also run the same Rex with the same thing okay so as you can see this shows uh, the prime number that's closest uh, to the counter we're in. And um, so we ran this program. Now let's see what other things we can do. Um, um, I have here a, an, a Rex program to calculate the Acker numbers. Um, it looks very simple, uh, but this will actually, uh, it's a funny, as you can see here, for, of course, first uh, first uh, line has to be a comment with the word Rex in it. And um, um, so what we do here is we, we actually break um, the Rex interpreter on purpose. Uh, and that's not a bug um, of uh, ZOS or, or, the, or, or introduced by IBM. It's just a a function that will uh, quickly um, break the uh, the stack um, because there's so much um, recursion and uh, that you know it exponentially grows uh, the stack until the stack will uh, will collapse and uh, the program will will abend and the interpreter in fact will uh, will abend. Um, so we can try this the same way we did it on the. Um, from the TSO command line because the output is just nicer to look at. Um, by the way, here you see how to call a procedure. There's a procedure which is like a function called Ackerman and it's being called here with the two numbers. Um, and, um, and then this is on entry to the function, to the procedure, you parse the arguments that were given to it, MM and NN. Okay, so you parse them, and, which means you read them in. Um, and if it's zero, obviously, um, this is a typical if, then you return. Um, if n is zero, then you return also. Um, but you can see here that it keeps calling itself. And this causes, of course, that a stack needs to be allocated for each recursion. And eventually, the, uh, the interpreter will run out of, st of uh, stack space. So let's, uh, let's see how to uh, make this work. This time we'll copy the name, so we got this done. Um, and uh, I wish, I have not installed the monitor here, the uh, IMON monitor by Greg Price, um, because we could see the CPU spinning up, or the CPUs, I don't know how many CPUs the system has. Um, you know, in by the way, before we run this X program, it's in every, uh, modern operating systems such as Windows or Linux or Unix, it's easy to see how many CPUs you have. If you're just logged into a TSO system which you have no ownership, um, if you're just a programmer like I am here, it's really difficult to find out how many CPUs there are. Um, it's not that easy. Um, you can find out by running some, for instance, rec scripts, um, um, but you have to go read some of the table system tables and there's no place where it actually shows. Um, how many CPUs you have. If you install the Greg Price monitor, I'm on monitor, it will show you. So I have no idea if it's one or 10 or 15. I have this, you know, I have no knowledge of the system whatsoever. I'm just, uh, I was just granted uh, um, a TSO login by the good grace of Preston. Um, so, okay, let's, let's do uh, this thing we did before. And then um, close it with a. By the way, the reason why we put um, this quote at the beginning is that TSO by default will uh, assume that the user ID is the high level qualifier qualifier for the data sets you want to use, which in my case will be correct because my login ID is Moshix. 
and the data sets are called MOSHICs. But um, if you wanted to TSO to interpret in the absolute terms, the whole data set name, you have to put um, quotes in front and behind. So you can see here, um, we ran this function. Um, Ackerman of zero, zero is one with one recursion. There's something wrong here, the code, it shouldn't say one, um, anyway. And you can see, that it starts to calculate more and more until control stack full. Okay, and that's just because the recursions are just going through the roof. This is crazy. Ackerman is one of those uh, um, codes or one of those problems that the algorithm for it is deceptively simple, but it will the complexity of the of the calculation just grows very, very fast. It's, it's crazy. Um, let's see if we have some um, wiki page about the Ackerman function. The Ackerman function, yep. Let's see what it says about that. Hope you can read it all. In computability theory, uh, named after William Ackerman, it's one of the simplest and earliest discovered symbols of total computable function that is not primitive recursive, no idea what that means. All primitive functions are total and computable, but the Eichmann function states that not all computable functions are primitive recursive. Still don't know what that means, um, but I know what it does. Um, and um, it just shows you here how quickly the calculation spins out of control. It's, it's, it's a great way to check the correct um, implementation of a of uh, an interpreter um, and even of a compiler uh, because of this, as you can see, extreme deep recursion. Um, oh, and it says it can be used as a benchmark compiler's ability to optimize recursion. So um, obviously uh, Rex would have a problem with that because it will eventually run out of stack space I and mean, it's not avoidable. Um, and I don't know, you have some conditions you can set in Rex so that on a certain condition that happens, you can catch the code I don't know if there's a condition within Rex to catch uh, the stack getting full or being full. Um, I have no idea about that. But um, as you can see here, uh, this is, again, this is not a bug in, in Rex or ZOS. It's just the way it is. And, um, so then I have, we've shown the prime numbers, we've shown uh, Acumen. What I'm doing right now is, um, oops. This is what I meant. Um, I'm implementing a new uh, program in Rex to calculate the um, the uh, n queen problems uh, with a uh, chessboard of n by n with n queens so that they cannot threaten each other. Um, and I'm going to write the exact same uh, algorithm that I wrote in PL1 and C and Assembler and a bunch of others. And uh, and then we're going to um, and then we're going to get this uh, uh, to run. And I'm going to post eventually. The, the full um, source code for this program once it's done in the next few days uh, in the description below this video. But for now, let's go and see how to compile a Rex program. Um, we saw here in TSO, we have foreground and batch. Let's see what batch offers. Hmm. Okay. Uh, let's do 14. Prog, prime. Rex, CSR class H, so we can see the compiler output and then we can create, create our own command fanx 14 not found. Hmm. Maybe, hmm. maybe the Rex compiler is not installed after all. Pro prime Rex without any other information yeah this doesn't seem to work um let's go to the foreground uh, foreground rex pro i have a feeling this is going to say the same thing yeah <laughs> so actually the rex compiler doesn't seem to be installed i'm very sorry folks i did not know that um 
well, if anybody has a system uh, that they can grab me log on to with a working Rex compiler. I would very much like to uh, test the Rex compiler, especially because I'm going to have the Enqueen problem um, written uh, in the next one or two days, and then uh, we can actually uh, check the performance of PL1 for the same problem with Rex, and I also have a version in C and one in Assembler. Um, and since it's exactly the same algorithm, it's a good way to test uh, compiler performance. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to show you. Uh, Rex can be used obviously also for um, system utilities. Rex for, uh, there's a, a fellow called Mark Zeldin, um, who is a guru uh, for ZOS and he has a ton of uh, programs that he writes um, to, um, to do all kinds of uh, interesting things. This ex executes IPM as a Rex function. function. Okay, let's see what this does. Okay, this is one very good example of um, a Rex program that can be used for system uh, work. Uh, save as, let's put it in. info.rex on my desktop. Uh, I have a feeling it saved it in HTML, so let me just copy the whole thing and then uh, where is it? Hmm. Oh, here it is. So, notepad. Let's remove this. Okay, and now we save it as uh, IPL info. Done. Now we upload this to um, to my system, uh, to present system. Um, send to host uh, IPL info and then Moshix work work prog IPL info. We select TSO and text and send it up. And since this is going over the internet, it's going to take a little while, but that's already done. Okay, and let's go have a look at it. Here it is. Okay, display the last latest IPL information for all LPARs. Um, so this should be interesting. Um, Mark Zeldin is one of the gurus. And uh, as you can see, his go-to language for something like this is not assembler. You could do this very easily in assembler or PL1. It's Rex, which is much more productive. Um, so I would just say we execute this and see what happens. Nevada members found in sys IPL history. Okay, <laughs> that was anticlimactic. Um, so, oh, because uh, I don't know. There's maybe, oh, maybe this is running without LPARs, this machine. I really don't know. Um, I, I, I thought that as of the Z9. I don't know what kind of uh, hardware this is, but as of Z of the Z9 mainframe, you had to run in an LPAR. I don't think you could run without LPARs. That's interesting. I, I know nothing about this machine. I, I will ask Preston, but um, I have no idea on what computer this is running. Well, um, but let's see what this program does. It goes and reads his IPL history. So we can do this ourselves. Start. And what was the, what was it called? Okay, so let's try um, IPL. 
oh there's no data set here called this way so i don't know um i'm one who chose very clearly when the machine was last ipl'd um but uh there's some data sets missing here i don't know what kind of uh, what kind of uh zos implementation this is um i'm just i'm just playing with things uh but and and um and we're learning a lot of stuff but um let's look again at the program oh it's it's news here okay um okay yeah this is easy enough to follow um uh, well i'm sure i could find other utilities that would work um i just don't know enough about uh, the implementation of this system and right now my terminal seems to have locked up i hope i didn't do anything bad um but um yeah maybe the whole machine went down no idea anyway uh i think we've seen enough uh of rex to get you started there's a book written by mike Kalishaw about rex i think the, it's a very thick book um you can find it used for 15 dollars on amazon if you like uh, rex um, um you can buy the book and and um, start studying it i i know that once you start writing a little bit in rex you will fall in love with the language it's a very forgiving very fast language and uh, it's a lot of fun to write stuff in rex and so um, i'm quite sure that once you start programming rex a little bit you'll get hooked and there's no place that's more correct or more right to run rex than on uh, vm and on zos uh, zvm and on zos uh, because it was it was made for those environments um, so um, unfortunately we don't have an mbs 3.8 if ibm is listening here um, and I'm sure I'm talking for all of the community here of people who want to learn more about the mainframe. Please do release MBS XA to the um, to the community um, uh, so that we can play with it. There's no commercial value to you, uh, uh, IBM, um, in MBS XA. It won't run on any of the machines you still sell today or are still running out there. Uh, but it would give us 31-bit. Um, ideally, it would release MVS XA with the, the COBOL and the PL1 optimizing compilers. Uh, I'm sure that you would. This is this will be the way to create a new generation of people who who like um, who, who like doing stuff in the mainframe. By the way, the analytics on the YouTube channel for this channel, uh, as of today, I think I have like 410 subscribers. The age is the most viewers are in the age bracket between 29 and 35 so uh this is this is the young people who want to learn about uh the mainframe about zos and about uh, your other mainframe uh, environments and by releasing mbs xa and hopefully also vm xa um, to the community you would do yourself a big service there's no commercial value to you for that for those operating systems but there's a huge value in in having community that knows more about it and starts to write more software for those environments and uh, creating the new generation of people who work on the mainframe. Um, I'm just saying this, uh, hopefully I, you know, somebody at IBM is listening. Anyway, thank you for watching today. Um, we're very thankful already to IBM for giving us MBS 3.8. Uh, don't get me wrong, no negative feelings here at all. In fact, very positive feelings uh, for IBM, but um, we could do more. Anyway, thanks for watching. Um, please uh, leave a, a thumbs up button if you press the thumbs up button if you like this video. Um, please do subscribe to the Moshix Mainframe channel to get notifications of future videos and see you soon on this channel. Bye.